Welcome to This Week in Missouri Politics, our first edition of 2023. We're here in Jeff City, the state capital, with the new speaker, Dean Plocker. Welcome back to the show. Great to be on, Scott. Good to be back to Jeff City. Over the new president pro tem of the Senate, Caleb Brown. Good to be here. And the minority leader, not the new one, <laughs> six years as minority leader. My goodness. Yeah, I'm excited. And the uh, Senate minority leader, uh, Senator John Rizzo, thank you for bringing the time. Thanks for having us. Speaker, you uh, outlined in your speech some goals. What were the top two or three things you want to see done that you want to see the House move this year? Well, I, we're going to address crime, right? I think crime is plaguing our state. Uh, we need to address that. It's destabilizing communities. It's affecting everybody's life. It's holding Missouri back. We're going to address crime. We also looked at education. We looked at tax cuts. So those are some three big things. Talk about addressing crime. I think everybody on some level thinks the city of St. Louis. Can you address crime without basically taking local control away from some folks in St. Louis? Well, we'll look at that. We're going to look at everything on the table. I, th I don't think there's one particular bill that's going to fix everything. I think there's got to be a lot of bills evaluated. They're going to go through committee. I have full faith in the caucus, in the body as a whole, to address crime and put a package together. Hope to send to the Senate. Hopefully we can get it done. Senator Rizzo, when I hear local control I, or crime, I think the city of St. Louis, I think Senator Carla May may have an issue with that. I mean, at some point... The Republicans were for low control right until John Cawthorn took the majority in Northeast Missouri. Sure. I haven't heard him say much about it since, but is that something you can let go through the Senate? Because it, if you're going to address crime from Jeff City, it's going to some point take power away from someone in St. Louis. Yeah, look, I mean, it's a little early to be laying down gauntlets like that, but, uh, you know, we'll, we'll keep an open mind on everything. But I will tell you, a lot of times these prosecutors in Kansas City area and Jackson County and St. Louis, St. Louis County are in a tough spot. Uh, we don't have a red flag law in the state. Uh, we had a school shooting in St. Louis. The people, excuse me, the people around the shooter did the right thing. They contacted the police. They came to the house and they couldn't take the gun away because we don't have a red flag law. We currently have a situation in the state of Missouri where a police officer can be fined for enforcing federal gun laws. So to point fingers at prosecutors, who, by the way, have been elected and reelected by their people and their communities and their districts, uh, is... It's difficult. Can we do things better? Absolutely. I think we can, and we're more than happy to have those conversations, but those conversations should start with some sort of measures that will get these guns under control. It was great. I've heard you talk about gun control in the past. I, I've been shocked throughout my time, just one of the Missouri Times, there was never a pro-gun control lobby. But I've watched his Moms Demand movement. I mean, they attract hundreds of people to their rallies in, in St. Louis, and not just St. Louis, St. Charles. It does feel like if you talk to cops, they do bring up the prosecutor issue in St. Louis, but they also bring up the gun laws. And Republicans back the blue sometimes, right? Absolutely. And I would say, you know, you mentioned St. Louis. Obviously, that's everyone's first thought. Where I'm from in Springfield is actually now one of the most high, highest crime cities in the entire country. Um, and that came out in a report just a couple weeks ago. And St. Louis actually wasn't on that list. And I say that, not that it's something I'm proud of, but because we need to be looking at this in a really holistic way. And to your point, every time I meet with our law enforcement down in Springfield and talk about what do you need from us, what is, what is the problem that we're seeing right now, the first thing they talk about is the gun laws. They say, we have XYZ going on with our youth. We have these issues. And every time we try to do our jobs, we can't because of the laws that you all have passed in Jefferson City. Other thing that's practically possible, it feels to me like passing a gun control measure through the Missouri Senate is something that is highly unlikely. Highly unlikely, yeah. I mean, I, I, I don't. A lot of things that I've, have been said by everybody, I agree with. Um, part part of it is just a matter of practicality on identifying the problem and identifying solutions that are viable, right? We, we could all wave magic wands and get a bunch of things that we want uh, if we could, but we can't. The Missouri Senate is the Missouri Senate. Uh, and so, you know, it's a matter of just identifying things that are possible, uh, that move us in the right direction. It's probably not gun related, um, but there are other things that are possible that I do think will help uh, curb crime in, in areas all across the state, which Crystal's right. Which is bigger one thing I've heard Republicans talk about for years, well, since they had the majority, was initiative petition reform. Yes. It is relatively easy, relatively easy, to put something on the ballot. And a lot of things Republicans have not been willing to pass to the legislature have passed the initiative petition process. What's a fair process look like? A fair process is something that's better vetted and, and, and brought forth to the public in a concise form. Um, we respect the voters, but at the same time, we have outside interests coming in with a lot of money, non-Missourians dumping a ton of money into Missouri to affect our citizens. You saw that with Clean Missouri. 
people didn't know what they were entirely voting on on Clean Missouri, so we brought back another proposal and fixed the redistricting component that they supported. Um, we look at this most recent initiative petition, it was 40 pages injected into our Constitution. I don't think a lot of people fully understand what those 40 pages will do to our laws. I don't. I think we're going to see a lot of problems develop. They're going to be appealed to the Supreme Court. It keeps our judiciary very active. Um, I would like bills uh, or, or laws that are brought forth to the voters to be better explained and not, and not using outside money from other billionaires that want to inject themselves into Missouri law. Representative, I have seen things that I've heard you talk about on this show many times come to fruition from the initiative petition process. But right now, currently, in the current process, where you grew up in Webster County, for a chunk of, for 10 years, it was in the 8th Congressional District. Mm -hmm. Right now, something gets on the ballot, no one has to care at all about Southeast Missouri and North Missouri. They have no part of putting something on the ballot. Is it really equity? I don't know, is it something I've heard you say a lot? Is that equitable? You know, I, I think that there are places where we can have this discussion. To the speaker's point, I mean, the money conversation is a real one. I'm going to pivot for a second and just respond, if I may, to the speaker in that I think when we're having these discussions, we need to be willing to hold ourselves to the same standard. And right now, outside money comes in all the time for our elections. And so why are we going to have that conversation for the initiative petition? When we talk about the threshold increases that I've heard the other side of the aisle say they want to make it more difficult by increasing thresholds, our elections are not done by that. So what makes us better than the people themselves? You've heard me say a million times, the initiative petition process in our state is different than many other states. And I think that is something that we should be protecting, not attacking, because it gives citizens the right to tell us, we don't like what you're doing, and we're going to work around you because you're not listening. Senator Rizzo, if you go to the, the Carhartt store in Independence that I went to last week, yeah. folks are a little more easy to sign an initiative petition if you stand out there and get their signature, right? Sure. If you stand outside of Ursulines and Bob or Bluff and somebody from the, with a state seal on a piece of paper asks you to sign it, they're going to be a little tougher to say. Is it fair that well, a fourth of this state is totally ignored by this process? Look, I, 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 to answer that question is one thing i think that the pattern and, and i'm trying to be as kind as i can with my colleagues because i enjoy a good relationship with both of them but i'm starting to believe that republicans don't like when people vote i mean last year we saw what we would consider a voter suppression bill pass through the senate uh, we were trying to make it easier to, for people to vote and you know we were able to get a couple weeks early voting which i'm very proud of but the rest of it was not great uh, we see every 10 years uh, districts get maneuvered in certain ways and you know now, now we're trying to to tighten up the initiative petition process i mean people vote this is how this happens whether it, how it gets on there why it gets on there, there there was a vote on medicaid expansion people wanted it there was a vote on recreational cannabis people wanted it there was a vote on to push back on right to work people wanted that and the unfortunate reason that, that truthfully that i think is a bit sad that it's going in the Constitution, which I agree with the Speaker. We, these things should not continue to go in the Constitution, but the problem is they can't trust the legislature to not mess with it. Senator Rowden, should you, should you kick out Jason Bean's family in Peach Orchard? Should, should <laughs> Rusty Black's family in Chillicothe not be asked to sign these things? Well, I think it, I mean, the, the, the point is valid. It, 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 the, the reality that in a state like ours, it's very, very diverse, uh, and, and I live in a you know, pretty urban area, um, but in a state like ours where you can go to St. Louis, Kansas City, certain parts of Springfield, certain parts of Columbia, and achieve any objective you want is not reflective of the state as a whole. Now, some of the points that they make about, and I'm a Republican from Columbia, so I can recognize um, that, that there, the reason why these things happen through the ballot process is because of perceived or actual inaction on our part. That's real, right? And that's why they do it. Sure. Um, but there also is a component of what the speaker is talking about, that it's just in clean Missouri was the perfect example. It was just an out-of-state billionaire that decided they wanted to get involved in Missouri politics. And he, he lost, he ended up losing. Uh, and, but that, and that was reflective of what the voters ended up uh, deciding after they realized what they were actually uh, looking at on their paper. And Scott, if I may interject here, I, I, I think we're all making great points, but one thing needs to be explained. There's two types of initiative petitions. There's statutory initiative petition and there's constitutional initiative petition. The voters vote on us. Yeah, th there is money that is used in elections that, that get people elected. We vote every day on the floor that we have to you know, hang our hat on and we're held accountable to our votes. Those are statutory 
laws that we pass in, the, in this building right here. But the initiative petition process we're speaking of is the constitutional reform package where it goes into the Constitution. We can't change the Constitution without taking that to the voters, period. We're just saying the threshold should be a little bit higher because our Constitution is our Constitution. It shouldn't be changed or added to willy-nilly with language that hasn't been really vetted. And I believe every Missourian vote matters. To get to your point, yes, Chillicothe matters, St. Louis matters, Webster County matters. I think they should have all, all have buy-in on how we're reforming our Constitution. Is there going to be room to maneuver on differentiating between statutory and constitution? Look, we're open to having any kind of conversation. And I would also say this, you know, and I've had this conversation with many people. Uh, if you change the initiative petition process constitutionally, that doesn't change the want of some of these processes or the things that happen like recreational cannabis or whatever. So the next step is if you can't change the constitution and protect it, you're going to start changing the legislature. Do you think Democrats would I think would her and I are okay with changing the legislature a little if, bit. If marijuana was not legal in the state, if Medicaid was not expanded, would Democrats do better at the ballot box? I think, I think that, yeah, I think that there's a real possibility that, that look, we're not unaware that, that cannabis is, is a big industry now. Yeah. And, and in that industry is gonna start opening up states. They are gonna eventually get to the state of Missouri and if they don't have a process by which to put that on the ballot, they're gonna start changing the legislature because this legislature was never gonna do that. I agree with you. This legislature was trying to defund Medicaid expansion for two years after they did it. So, I mean, we know why they do it. Now, and, and I wanna reiterate what the, the speaker said, I totally agree with him. It should not go in the constitution, but at the same time, this is their only outlet. You take that outlet away, they're going to start changing the legislature. You're worried about the ballot box. If, you, if folks can't do things like Medicaid or, or cannabis, do you think Republicans fare worse? You know, let it go to the... That's what we're here for. We're here to serve the people. I have to answer to my constituents. I have to answer to 6.1 million Missourians as the Speaker of the House. I welcome this discussion. I welcome the input to craft better laws, not change our Constitution using billionaires' money from out of state that have no, they have no ties to Missouri. We'll take a break and talk about the topic. Everybody, including the Secretary of State, told you guys about education reform. Be right back after this, but first go to showmissouri.com. This is Missouri one county at a time. We sit and talk to a lot of the retiring senators and we sit down with Dave Schatz, his, uh, his predecessor, talked to all things, hogs, dogs, and logs there in, in uh, at, at his uh, at office at Schatz Underground. It was a great time. Go to showmissouri.com. This is Missouri one county at a time and the history of some senators' careers. We'll be right back after this. For more than a century, the St. Louis Carpenters Union has shaped our communities. Through trusted alliances, we deliver skilled professional craftspeople while our business partners provide the kind of quality jobs that keep our economy humming. It's a blueprint that has worked since 1882. Turning Missouri into a right to work state stalls progress, wipes out jobs and kills momentum. Right to work is wrong for everyone. Let's keep Missouri moving forward. Visit carpdc.org to learn more. Reach your audience with Outreach Studios. Studio 17 offers 1,000 square feet of customizable space that can accommodate roundtable discussions, podcasts, live stream content, and much more. For a different look, we offer View 17. This one-of-a-kind event center is fully wired for broadcast and is perfect for corporate or commercial content. With Outreach Studios, the opportunities are endless. Elevate your message, your brand, and your expectations with Outreach Studios. Data captured by our state-of-the-art monitors helps us pinpoint the timing and location of severe weather more accurately and respond to trouble more quickly. Ameren Missouri's investment in smart technologies like this is one way we're improving reliability and restoring power faster than ever. Responding to trouble before trouble hits. That's energy at work. Ameren, Missouri. Welcome back to this week of Missouri Politics from the state capitol in Jefferson City. We are joined by the minority leader of Missouri Senate, John Rizzo. Thank you for sticking around. Representative Crystal Quaid, the House Minority Leader. The new speaker of the House, Dean Plogger. Thank you for sticking with us. And the new, uh, the new Senate uh, President Pro Tem, Caleb Brown. Senator Rowden, you talked a little bit in depth about education reform. Something you talked about many times, many times on this show. What does education reform look like for just an average parent nationally? Well, I think it's, it, we, it, part of what I said in my speech yesterday was we have 
really, no, nobody views education policy or education in general and talks about it in the terms that we talk about it in this building, right? Mm -hmm. So the idea is we always skip to the end, which for us, the end is for a guy who believes in reform, the end is, you know, school vouchers, charter expansion, all these things that get thrown around here all the time. The, the process that should lead us there is a, an overhaul of accountability and transparency uh, to make sure that education is doing the very best that it can for the most amount of kids, public education, in our state. I think there are plenty of things that we can do in the process before we get to the end. I, I want to get to the end. I would love to see every parent in this state have the ability to take their kid wherever they want to go, free of any concern of how much money is in their bank account. That's the goal for me. But there are also a number of things, and I think bipartisan things in some cases that we can do to uh, allow for our public education institutions to get better, to continue to thrive, to provide more, uh, better outcomes for their kids. I said in my speech, we want to fund uh, world-class schools like world-class schools, and I want to pay world-class teachers like world-class teachers. I think it's a travesty that folks that have stood up for that, as, uh, that old guard establishment model of education says that a teacher who's just kicking butt and taking names every day has to get paid the same as this one, if for no other reason than they're part of the same how agreement. Do you, how, do you pay how do you judge a teacher's effort when, if you're in a poor area, frankly, a kid that's not well-fed, kid that's not well, doesn't have access to a lot of health care, maybe doesn't have the best home life. How do you judge that from a kid in Ladue? Hey, judge that teacher. I mean, you could have a teacher doing far better, but their class, it's hard to reflect Yeah, that. I mean, I think there's a number of things you can do relative, one, to, to school sizes, to, to district sizes. My sister taught at West Boulevard Elementary in, in Columbia for 10 years, probably the, the, the worst school for a lot of the things that you're talking about. And she came home, and she would, she would tell us stories all the time of those sorts of things. I'm not uh, downplaying that, and I'm, I certainly don't want to do anything to um, you know, discourage teachers from, from being all that they can be. But I do think it's one of the only uh, uh, industries in the world where, um, where you don't get paid better because you are better. I think that is a disservice to kids, and I think we should fix it. I hear Republicans talk about, well, you need health care, pull yourself by your bootstraps. You, you want to buy nicer things, you want to go to that, pull yourself by your bootstraps. I hear when people talk about education, well, you could move to a better school district, pull yourself out your bootstraps. There's no bootstraps. There are none. And, and I, you know this, Scott, but prior to becoming a legislator, I worked for a nonprofit that partnered with public schools that provided funding for basic needs for kids. When we talk about teacher performance and how well they're doing, your point is exactly right in that when we've got kids who are hungry, they're not going to be sitting still in a classroom and they're not going to be able to learn. And so I actually worked in the field where we would fund through the public school systems to pay for things that kids need to be successful. And I can tell you that it wasn't just kids in Webster County who were struggling. It was kids in rich schools, it's kids in, in poor neighborhoods. And so that conversation of just moving to another place, one is just ridiculous because we know that uh, single parents, low income folks, that it's not easy to just pick up and move. Mm -hmm. People need support systems and to just leave all that because the school district is suffering is the problem. This conversation for me, of course, we're open. I'm a parent, I, I've got three kids that all are in public schools and I, this conversation is important. But bottom line for me is that we have been underfunding our schools for decades in this state. Transportation was not fully funded for two decades in this state until last year. The full, we fully fund the formula. We can have that debate all day long about changing that formula several, several years ago. You say and, it's, not, it's not funded well compared to what? And, and to, to com compared to what school districts are saying that they need from us to be successful. And so when we have a conversation about altering the way that we are educating our kiddos or holding our teachers to a different standard, looking at merit or whatever. Basically, we've been underfunding them so that we could privatize them. You underfund them, they're not gonna be successful, then you have your argument about why we should do something differently. I would like us to see, have real conversations about what those needs are in our districts, in our poorer communities, in our richer communities, what do our school districts need to be successful, including teacher pay and staff pay, and con continuing to have that discussion in a much broader way than we are. Senator Rizzo, I, when I heard Senator Rowden talk about that, it reminds me of Harold Kasky. He would legislate for 10 years, one line of a statute, and by yeah. the time he was done, it's different. Um, if, if the goal is to go where Senator Robin wants to go, why do you, why do you help along that path? Uh, I, I think before we even start to have those conversations, we've got to start having a conversation about being competitive with starting teacher salaries. Give the governor the credit. He, he put it in his budget last year. He did a great job with getting it through, thanks to Senator Rowden as the floor leader and, some, and, 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 and Representative Plockert and, and Representative Quaid. 
uh, we all kind of pulled together on that, but we're still at 50. I mean, we can't even begin to start talking about, I think, a lot of these different uh, ideas on how we can make it more competitive and stuff until we get to the baseline, right? And teachers are 50 out of 50 in the state of Missouri. We just had one of our biggest school districts in my district and independents go to four days. I don't think that's preparing kids very well. They're at four days a week and the world doesn't work in four days a week. Business world is five. People, what does that kid do on Friday? Well, right. What do they do on Friday? And more importantly, what do they do when they're applying for the same colleges with the kid from Kansas in my neck of the woods or Illinois and St. Louis's neck of the woods that's going to school five days a week? You know, what, what are they going to do if they're applying for the same job out of high school and the kid in Blue Springs or the kid in, uh, yeah, the kid in Blue Springs is, is working against the kid in Overland Park who's gone to school five days a week, had his schools very well funded, and, and they're going to compete. This is a competitive world. And, and you know, we, we, I, I would be, I'm more than happy to work with Senator Brown. We work on a million different things on trying to make things more competitive and, and bonuses for teachers or whatever it might be. But we got to get to the baseline. Of, of making sure people want to be teachers because they can have a salary they can raise a family on. I mean, beyond teachers, I mean, they're moms, they're dads, they're, you know, they have to have a family. And there was a $37,000 a year is the average starting salary for a teacher. When carton of eggs is $6, carton of milk is $6 right now, that's, that's pretty tough. Mr. So Speaker, this used to be an urban rule thing. You have taken up the mantle of maybe the leading politician that cares about rural Missouri, maybe second to only the guy down the hall here, the governor. How do you go to Herman Morris? And people say, all oh, these schools are woke and liberal. Well, he has the Richland Rebels in his district. How do you go to Herman Morris and say, hey, we know better than the Richland Rebels school. We know you should vote with us, not your local school district. That's a tough case to make, isn't it? Well, I, we respect the school districts. I, I'd like to see greater participation in some capacity there. But I think what we can all agree on in education right now is the status quo is not working, that we need to do better. I would argue that just throwing money at the problem isn't just going to fix the problem, though. I think we have to articulate how we do that. I think we have an adequate system of teacher pay, as Senator Rowden pointed out. It should not be a time-based system. It should be a merit-based system. Let's have that discussion. Figure out how we can pay teachers more, but give them a reward for working harder, working more effective, being innovative in their teaching skills for our kids. Um, you know, we want to make sure the kids get to school, get fed and everything that can always be discussed. But I think we need to create some competition. I think parents should have choices where they send their kids. Uh, it shouldn't be based just on your zip code. Um, we're open to all of this. And I think if you if you look at some of these school districts in rural Missouri and in urban Missouri, the, they're failing our kids and our kids. We cannot afford to fail if we're going to keep Missouri the great state that it is. So, Ryan, I watched you work. <laughs> You were everywhere on that ESA bill. Every office you'd be coming out of, you run that Scooby-Doo thing where they run all across the halls. Uh, it's, it's been in effect for a year now, I guess? Yeah, you're getting there, yeah. Is it working? Are you happy with, are you <laughs> yeah, happy I mean, with it? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the, the take-up rate's been good. Obviously, I think it's probably too early to tell what the, what the outcome is going to be. It, it's not a silver bullet, right? I mean, I think the, 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 the point that, that I think everybody's made here is that there are and it's the point that I made in my speech yesterday. It is, it, it's not one thing that's going to fix this problem. It's a whole bunch of things. That was a big bill. Though. It, it, it was a big bill. And I watched I, you work and work and work and the, work. The, the point that I would... How are we going to know it's successful? That's my question. Well, I mean, it's going to take some time, but I think you're going to see, you know, you're going to see, uh, uh, you're, you're going to need to see uh, kids that are performing better, that you're going to need to see test scores that are going up, uh, you know, and just generally things moving in the right direction. The question I would ask for folks that just say we're being underfunded, just tell me how much money is enough. That, that is the question that I've asked over and over and over and over again. In addition to the hundreds of millions of new dollars that we throw into public education every year, you tell me how much more is enough, and I'll work my tail off next year to put it in there to hold your feet I've to the fire. I've observed for a while since I was a staffer here, and the only number I ever hear is more. It is, it is, a, it is a terribly lazy and terribly unproductive way to help our students. And it, 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 it really is what may, has made this education conversation as antiquated and as ridiculous as it is in this building. And it is the fault of the other side. Made prediction. Is there gonna be a bill that is described as education reform moved this year? If they're in the supermajority, they can put the gas pedal down whenever they want. 
We're and, thinking, and we will do the best we can to make well, the it. The House will pass many, many bills, right? <laughs> I mean, yes, that's, that's, yeah. that's the key, as, as the Senator said. Uh, we are in the super minority, and so our, our mm -hmm. job is to try to find places where we can um, compromise on the other side, convince some minds, slow mm -hmm. some stuff down when, when we can, but ultimately, um, and, but that's where I want to kind of piggyback on that and say, we've been in the super minority for a long time. If education's not working, we haven't been in control. Give me a prediction. Do you, it does feel like a lot of your colleagues that may be hesitant to some of the things you talked about. The pay structure seems like something you could try, right? Yeah, and, and I don't want to. I, I don't think it's possible, frankly, just to say the, the, the end thing, the charter expansion. Yeah. That We're not going to push those things through in and of themselves because it's just a part of the master plan. We've got to be more focused and diligent in saying let's do four or five or six things, most of which I think some will get bipartisan consistency. Yeah. Let's, let's do a bunch of stuff. And then we got to figure out if it makes a difference. Explain. You called out a couple of bills, specifically in your speech, that dealt with postnatal care. Mm -hmm. Senator Gannon, Senator Cole, what are those bills? Yeah, so Senator Gannon worked last year with the support of one of the most crazy uh, groups of, of supporters, MRL and NARAL and a whole host of others, um, on a bill that would just say right now uh, uh, moms that uh, qualify for Medicaid can only get up to a certain amount of time, 30 days in Missouri. We, we'd like to span, expand that to a year. Um, you know, and, and it makes a ton of sense. There was really only one, maybe two main obstacles in the Senate last year. Senator Coleman was the other one that I talked to that, that, that referenced yesterday that, that says if you're working your way up, if you're qualifying for benefits, but you have the chance to get a raise, you have the chance to, to, to bring on some new resources, you, you don't get your benefits pulled directly out from underneath you without something, some ability for you to account for that through a you know, step down or something like that. You know, Republicans, and so I said, all that stuff to me is pro-life, right? We, 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 we have a weird definition of pro-life in this building, and it's only specific to abortion. There's a bunch of stuff that we can do that I consider as a person of faith to be very, very pro-life, and I think we should do those things. It feels like something that I think you could support, right? I actually filed the first Cliff Effect bill in 2016, and we did pass a pilot program with the help of Senator Arthur on the other side, dealing specifically with the child care subsidy program that the senator highlighted. Um, and so, yes, very excited that Senator Coleman is wanting to expand that. The original hearings that we had, folks are saying, we want to do that for this program and this program, and I'm glad that we're having that discussion in a real way. And, and the same for the postpartum care. Uh, Representative Martha Stevens uh, had a bill that we passed dealing specifically with substance abuse programming. We know that that works, so I'm excited to see that expand for all mothers. Um, and so, yeah, I think I'm very grateful that in the, that this conversation, um, and unfortunately how we got here, I, I'm not grateful for, but what does it mean to be pro-life? Because for me, it is supporting families. And I'm very, very grateful that we are finally having a discussion. Um, and, you know, a lot of this has to do with the workforce uh, issues as well. I think those things intersect completely. If we can be supporting our families and providing things like addressing the cliff effect where families have things pulled out from underneath them, that's going to help employers. It's going to help workers find jobs. And I'm grateful that we're having this discussion. Representative Quaid, Senator Rizzo. Senator Rowden, Speaker Volker, thank you so much for joining us. I sure enjoyed the discussion. And we will see you next week. Back here from the state capitol for this week in Missouri politics. This week in Missouri politics is sponsored by the Missouri Automobile Dealers Association, Ameren, Spire, and Sterling Bank.